Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, hope you're all well today. Um, welcome to today's uh, Manufacturers Forum. We'll be beginning in five minutes, so please uh, grab your teas, coffees, or whatever else you need this morning to, to kickstart you. Um, you're certainly in for a treat. So we'll be kicking off at 8.05. Okay, great. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's 8.05, so we're going to be kicking off uh, this the forum. So distinguished CAM members, NCBA customers, and anyone else who's joined, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely excited and thrilled to welcome you all for this first joint manufacturers forum for this year themed trade and forex solutions in volatile markets. 
um, an apt forum considering the WhatsApp and Facebook outage we had last night that brought life for some of us to a standstill. For those of you who didn't notice, that's the life I want. Um, my name is uh, Fazan Choudhury. I am the head of industrials, corporate banking at NCBA Bank. Um, and I will be hosting us through this, this program. Um, once again, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this morning on, on this very useful webinar. Um, for a bit of background, earlier this year, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers and NCBA entered into a partnership with the view of empowering manufacturers with information, capacity building, um, and various tools that we have available to us to share. Um, the information will spearhead SMEs within this market for business and growth. As such, we are delighted to host this forum today and provide you with insights on trade and forex that we believe will be beneficial to your business. To steer this conversation, we are delighted to be joined by a distinguished panel of guests who will help us navigate the conversation around this theme. We have um, Mr. Rajan Shah, who's the vice chair of Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and he's also a director of Capital Industries. We have Mr. John Okulo, who's the, grab, the group director, corporate banking and CBA group. We have Mr. Rafael Agung, um, our chief economist at NCBA Group. We have Mr. George Kiluva, who's the head of trade finance for NCBA again. And Ms. Joyce Jogu, who is a head at CAM Consulting and Business Development. Um, during, during this uh, webinar, you know, we'd like to make it as, as interactive as possible. So please feel free to ask any questions that you have in the Q&A session, we have um, various people online who will be able to assist um, and answer those questions as we, as we go along. Um, if there's anything that we see we want to put to the panel, uh, we, will, we will select those questions and put the, them to the panel. Where we are unable to answer at the moment due to time or whatever reason, we'll aim to, risk, to share those responses uh, later. So please feel free to absolutely uh, send all the questions that you possibly got. We understand totally that it's a, a volatile market. Um, there's a lot of uh, information that you might need. There's a lot of guidance that you might need. So please feel free. Now, it gives me a great pleasure to invite uh, Mr. Rajan Shah um, to give his opening remarks. And then this will be followed by Mr. John Okulo. By the way, um, John is um, somewhere in Jinja, um, and the world that we are in today is, is fully connected. Um, but before we get to, to John, um, Rajan, over to you. Welcome to the forum. Uh, thank you, Fazan. Uh, allow me to first appreciate some of the distinguished guests here in the panel. Uh, so the NCBA uh, Group Director of Corporate Banking, John uh, Okulo. Uh, NCBA Group uh, Head of Industrials and Corporate Banking, Fozan uh, Chaudhry, uh, NCBA Group Chief Economist, uh, Rafael Agang, and uh, NCBA Group Trade uh, Head of Trade and Finance, George Kilua, one of our own, CAM Head of Consulting and Business Development, Joyce Jogu. Uh, dear members, uh, and uh, great to see you all. Good morning. Uh, I first of all appreciate NCBB for making a deliberate effort to support uh, the manufacturing SME in, in, the, in the country. Uh, CAM, uh, as its manufacturing priority agenda, uh, recognizes the special role that SME plays in our country's uh, economy. Uh, they are the future of industry, and hence we must continue to support their growth and development. Uh, this is also what uh, the government sees and uh, in terms of where the growth of uh, the manufacturing sector is going to come, and we are very cognizant of that. Uh, today, we are here to take a step forward towards the trade finance and forex solutions for manufacturing SMEs, plus any other conversations uh, we have uh, in this forum towards in ensuring that we build capacity and help our SME sector. So I just want to kind of give you a little bit of a background of who we are as, uh, as an association of Kenya Association of Manufacturers. 
Uh, we are a business members organization, which uh, represent primarily the manufacturing sector the S, uh, and uh, the value add sector. And we were established uh, in 1959. So we are now about 62 years old. Uh, as an association, we have grown into a dynamic, uh, vibrant, credible body that unites industrialists and offers a common voice for business. We have been at the forefront in driving fact-based uh, policy advocacy towards the formation of industrial policies to strengthen and support the country's development. Let me give you a, a, a background of a few, uh, a few things that we offer as services. So the first one, as I mentioned, is the policy advocacy. So what does that mean uh, in terms of what do we do there? Uh, some of the areas that we, uh, we uh, support uh, in terms of this advocacy are relating to taxation, trade infrastructure, energy, illicit trade regulations, amongst many others. We also engage uh, in this uh, world of devolution with county officials on challenges facing manufacturers, such as double taxation, especially on county levies and fees. The third area of advocacy relates to uh, trade agreements uh, within the region and beyond. Uh, especially, we work uh, very closely within the EAC community, the COMESA, the SADAC, the AGOA, and uh, more recently, the Afri Africa Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement and the Tripartite Free Trade Agreement. Uh, we offer, offer technical services, advice on taxation and fiscal policy, uh, and also provide uh, uh, regulatory and compliance uh, related advocacy. Uh, and finally, on advocacy on promotion of ethical uh, business practice. Uh, secondly, uh, how do we kind of, and more uh, very important to our priority agenda is how do we make our uh, members competitive and resilient? And towards this end, I think, and this has become a very relevant area of uh, focus, especially after COVID. Uh, CAM offers various business development and competitive services that are tailored to competitiveness, uh, resilience, productivity, and support the manufacturing sector's journey towards green growth. Uh, securing the future of work through the, uh, the, the Manufacturing Academy and the Technical and Vocational Education and Training Program. The Manufacturing Academy provides technical and specialized management training services to drive competitiveness. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we run a TVET program run in partnership with the German Development Corporation, which enhances access to technical and vocational jobs, as well as economic opportunities for the youth in Kenya through skills and entrepreneurship development. A third area of uh, focus for CAM is promoting market access. What do we do there? Uh, we strengthen uh, uh, our members' uh, ability to scale up and trade uh, and, uh, in, in, and in various export markets and development for the local manufacturers through its business information service desk. The services offered include seminars, workshops on compliance issues, trade, investment missions, and productivity courses. Uh, something more in which we have done in the last couple of years is, uh, is called the annual Changamka Shopping Festival that brings together local manufacturers to showcase their high quality of locally manufactured goods and sell their uh, products in, to the public at discounted prices. This year, we shall be hosting the Changamka Festival in Nairobi and Mombasa. Fourthly, scaling up SMEs. This is at the heart of uh, our uh, uh, strategy. And specifically, we have actually formed what's called the Manufacturing SME Hub, where we address challenges affecting SMEs in the country, including unfriendly policies and regulatory regime, tedious and lengthy processes in quality standards and certification, access to markets, access to affordable finance, uh, which I guess we're going to probably allude to today, and poor governance structures. The hub fosters the development of a flourishing entrepreneurial culture and competitiveness small, for small and medium manufacturers in Kenya and the region. Services offered through the hub include business advisory services, tailored technical, operational, and management training, 
access to finance through business planning, financial literacy, access to markets uh, through value chain linkages. We also offer uh, services to, I mean, towards the green growth and circular economy, which has again become a very relevant topic uh, in the last couple of years. Through the Center for Green Growth and Climate Change, CAMP provides a one-stop solution to deepen industry level interventions, promote a circular economy, promote climate change uh, actions and financial linkages that prioritize people and the planet. The center services include resource efficiency services, energy, water, wastewater audits, waste and circular economy, resource uh, mapping, capacity building and green finance. Lastly, um, as far as uh, CAMS, uh, also, uh, CAM also looks into the inclusivity and bridging the gender gap. CAM runs a women in manufacturing program, which provides a platform for women to network, to mentor, to be mentored and improve their competitiveness and access to local, regional and global markets. Initiatives towards this end, include like the annual Women in Manufacturing Gala dinner that celebrates women and recognizes their role in the manufacturing se sector. Recently, just a couple of weeks ago, we had an event in Eldoret where we brought women in manufacturing from that region uh, towards achieving this objective. Linkages with successful women in industrialists across the continent and in the world and market linkages across East Africa and the continent amongst many others. To conclude, earlier this year, as Rosh Fazan alluded to, CAM and NCBA signed an MOU informed by the challenges facing manufacturing SMEs in accessing finances since they are considered high risk by financial institutions. This forum therefore is a part of the areas of partnership through which we seek to drive SME growth in our country. I appreciate all of you taking your time to be part of this forum today. I wish you all a fruitful uh, session and discussions and way forward. Thank you. Great, great, um, Rajan, thanks, thanks for that very in-depth um, um, introduction. Um, you know, as you, as you rightly said, you know, the, the partnership between NCBA and uh, um, CAMP is, is, a, is a match made in heaven. Um, a lot of the things that you've brought out, I think, are critical to our SMEs within this market, um, also to um, sort of grow our GDP and, and generally across the value chain. Some of the things that we, which I thought were really good that you mentioned, you know, was the, the, the technical assistance that you provide with respect to, you know, guiding or um, government with fiscal policy, you know, the training programs that you have, um, what you're looking to do to scale into export markets, you know, helping um, scale SMEs, uh, access to various markets to value chain integration, um, and you know, green green finance. I think for us as NCBA, all of those um, align uh, very well into our strategic initiatives. Um, and I think this is probably a, a really good forum for us to explore those further together. Um, very much with respect to what you said about um, moving our our local SMEs into the AAC, Comesa and Agoa, um, you know, I'd like to introduce um, John Okulo, our group director of uh, corporate banking, who's uh, very nicely sitting in Jinja at the moment um, with exactly that mandate to assist us uh, growing into uh, country trade um, from Kenya to Uganda and also seeing what we can do to capacity build for local companies looking to expand there. So, over to you, John, with the wonderful um, palm tree in the back. I see it's uh, sunny weather. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fauzan. To the CAM leadership led by uh, Mr. Rajan Shah, the vice chair, and uh, Joyce uh, Njogu from Business Consulting, the CAM members and our guests today, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I hope that you can hear me clearly. Yes, we can, John. Thank you. It is indeed a pleasure and an honor to convene on this virtual platform today. We indeed appreciate how the COVID 
19 pandemic has changed the way we engage with each other but we remain hopeful that one day we shall soon be able to have this engagement in person however as my colleagues have mentioned the pandemic has taught us to be agile and we're able to communicate and engage from different geographic locations a while back the CAM membership and NCBA signed an MOU that envisioned the establishment of a platform through which members of CAM and the bank could benefit from information sharing on our unique but highly integrated industries. I am indeed glad to see this come to fruition today. This inaugural engagement comes on the backdrop of the Global Customer Service Week and embodies what for me the partnership envisioned, which is to enrich our engagements beyond the traditional scope of products. Our conversation today is themed trade finance and foreign exchange solutions in volatile markets. It's timely given the risks that the pandemic continues to pose to businesses. Indeed, the pandemic's evolution continues to shake business models by altering consumer behaviors, which is core to manufacturers top line and introducing new risks to the supply chain. From what I've gathered through my interactions with a number of manufacturers is that business continues to be challenged by the disruptions to global supply chains, the high cost of energy and other commodity prices, as well as fragile demand, most of which are beyond individual manufacturers and businesses control. These challenges are aggravated by the unique and uneven scale of adjustments by economies to the pandemic, epitomized by the high volatility in markets. In 2020, for instance, the Kenya shilling lost 8.9% to the US dollar and continues to face some pressure into this year, increasing the overall cost of doing business for those businesses that are unable to manage the exchange risk effectively. On the flip side, the depreciating shilling has broadly improved the profit margins of exporters and the price competitiveness of their exports. If, if there is one lesson I've drawn from the pandemic experience is the need to continuously sharpen our risk management acumen, to understand and effectively manage events beyond the traditional scope of risk. This is especially more critical for those entities that operate in more established, competitive and mature industries where profit margins are consistently being squeezed. However, it is my belief that collectively through the exchange of knowledge, we have a chance to improve our operational efficiencies, increase certainty of earnings and gain a competitive edge by effectively managing the broad spectrum of known and emerging risks. Hence today's forum. Following the merger two years ago between NIC Bank and CBA, we at NCBA have significantly strengthened our financial reach and expertise. As the third largest bank in customer deposits and the fourth largest in terms of total assets, we have the capacity to provide even stronger support to your ever evolving financial needs. Our scope of support is not only limited to Kenya, but extends to other geographical, geographical jurisdictions in Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Ivory Coast, where we have a presence, but it also extends to all major global markets through our extensive correspondent banking network. I am privileged to be joined today by my colleagues from our global markets and trade finance teams will be presenting and discussing some of the emerging risks and the available mitigants offered by NCBA. I believe that today marks the beginning of sound information sharing on issues that confront all of us as businesses. And I look forward to the discussions. With those three words, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And I hand over back to uh, Mr. Fauzan Chaudhry. Thank you. Uh, John, thank you very much for that um, introduction on uh, on NCBA Bank. Um, you know, thanks very much for for raising some of the um, sort of the risks and and 
the issues that we're going to raise during this forum. Um, you know, I particularly liked the references that you made to, you know, disruption to supply chains, um, you know, the high volatility in markets, um, you know, what happened in 2020 with respect to the increased FX rates, um, the dollar, the way that it went up, you know, the shilling depreciating and that helping our, our exporters. Um, so, you know, all of that is, is, is very relevant to what's been happening today um, in these current markets. Um, and I think what you brought out very effectively was the fact that, you know, knowledge is power. And if we can um, identify what the risks are, we are all in a better off position to mitigate those risks. Um, so, you know, thank you very much uh, for, for, for those um, opening remarks. Um, and again, thank you so much. I know you, you left at 5.30 in the morning to make it to Jinja so that you could join this, uh, this forum. So we, we really appreciate it. Um, thanks once again. Thank you. Um, with that, now I'd like to introduce, um, you know, I, I said I was going to not make it such an elaborate uh, um, introduction, but uh, I can't help myself. Anyway, in the US, they have uh, Warren Buffett, AKA known as the Oracle of Omaha. In Kenya, I'd like to introduce our very own Oracle of NCBA. Raphael, as our chief, chief economist, is a library on his own. And for some of us, we believe he has superpowers as he's able to forecast much that comes through. And he tends to be right most of the time. At some point, I've even considered having him predict our lottery numbers uh, because he's that good. Anyway, to cut a long story short, welcome Mr. Gung, our chief economist. Um, looking, to your, looking forward to your words of wisdom. Over uh, to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Fozan. I think the, uh, what I wasn't prepared for was uh, 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 those superlatives, but thank you very much for your very kind uh, remarks. Um, uh, welcome members of CAM, and of course my colleagues who are on the call from Global Markets, and of course uh, also the uh, trade team and the entire corporate banking team at uh, NCBA. Uh, in keeping to uh, our fidelity, the MOU that was signed a while back, I think this is the first of uh, what I anticipate to be uh, numerous forums for us to interact and share uh, ideas or solutions for our respective businesses. Uh, and I think more importantly, just to uh, push the agenda of uh, policy formulation and advocacy, which I think is very key, as uh, Mr. Rajan alluded to, uh, for the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. I have to say I was a bit surprised by the history of CAM, and thanks Rajan for that. I, I, I always thought CAM uh, uh, was much younger than the 62 years that you last read, but right? it obviously shows because uh, if you look at the policy terrain in the last uh, 10, 15 years, I think uh, there are two notable um, member bodies uh, that one has to pick up, and that has is obviously CAM and the and KEPSA. Some of which there is cross sharing of the membership. So I'm, I'm very happy to uh, to note uh, that progress. Now, what I'll attempt to do is um, uh, we, in terms of approach, uh, our team has uh, provided uh, one arm of our solutioning aspect of the bank in terms of trade solutions. But what I'll do is I'll try and preface that uh, with just a quick rendition of what we are seeing um, evolving in the macroeconomic context of the day, but relate it more directly to what we think happens to be a cost given the uh, cost of doing business for some of your manufacturers, uh, given the reigning volatility uh, in light of the uh, raging pandemic. And that is the exchange rate or FX volatility, if you will. Uh, the uh, place to start, if I can go to uh, slide number 10, is uh, we obviously saw a very big blip uh, in March of 2020 in terms of just global financial markets. Uh, what we track is the Chicago Board of Exchange, um, uh, what we call the fear index. And if you can see, uh, the chart to my left uh, shows you a very quick uh, blip. Uh, we had a long reigns of uh, reasonable stability, and then, of course, at the onset of COVID, uh, primarily around March, February, March of 2020, so that sort of jump. Uh, it's ebbing slowly uh, and coming back to near pre-COVID levels, 
uh, but what you can see from the um, chart itself is there's still numerous uh, accounts of volatility. And of course, uh, this volatility is widespread uh, across all asset classes. Uh, but what's more pertinent to us today, of course, is the foreign yeah, exchange market, particularly currencies. Yeah. Okay, and the uh, the uncertainty, of course, is coming directly uh, from the pandemic itself. And I think you've had this ad nauseum from numerous webinars you've attended, or indeed all the business press that you read. Uh, what did happen, at least uh, prior to the uh, onset of the crisis, of course, we've had uh, what in financial markets we refer to as fragilities of different forms, depending on region or territory. Uh, in the African context, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, of course, uh, you had the whole uh, debt overhang questions uh, that was already uh, boiling. Uh, of course, uh, those fragilities have only been exacerbated on the negative side, uh, but on a positive side, there's also been a massive escalation of uh, digitization broadly. And we've seen, for instance, those of you who follow um, uh, the central bank, uh, data or releases, you've seen, for instance, that uh, mobile interactions have moved to almost 83%. So from just about 50%, it shot up to almost 100% of mobile transactions moving onto the mobile terrain. So there's been a very quick uh, escalation of uh, the uh, uptake of uh, digital financial solutions, which I think is a positive uh, in terms of just what we see in the evolution of business models uh, broadly. Uh, be that as it may, uh, as we speak, uh, economic prospects have improved, uh, especially uh, from the second quarter of this year. And uh, that pros those improved prospects, of course, is largely anchored on uh, increased uh, states of vaccination, especially in the OECD countries. Of course, it was always going to boil down to a question of uh, you know, uh, financial strength or who has the wherewithal. Uh, to be able to uh, support their economies. Of course, uh, in our case, yes, vaccination is uh, escalating, but uh, still uh, pretty low. Uh, there's also been unprecedented policy support across the world. Uh, of course, uh, from a monetary policy side, you've had increased accommodative monetary policy stances being pursued. But on the fiscal side, you've seen significant, significant uh, explore into uh, supporting economies um, as a bill. From emerging and developed markets, which is where we fall, uh, the debt overhang still stays. And uh, perhaps it will, be, it will be part of the discussion as we get into the plenary on why we think uh, we ought to pay attention to developments there and what, of what consequence it has to our, our reflex markets. Uh, the, of course, the recovery uh, was going to be divergent, as I've said, uh, heavily predicated on one, uh, the intrinsic strength of the respective economy. So if you had uh, some watches into the crisis, and of course, if you're richer, you can uh, vaccinate faster, you can get access to vaccine. Of course, a huge question around policy circles remains uh, vaccine inequity and the nationalism that has come with it. And I guess we can explore that some of that discussion in the in the uh, QA or, or, or plenary. Uh, the recovery will remain uh, that divergent, uh, just because uh, the, the strength to which you recoil back on your policy support is heavily predicated on the fight, or, or rather your success or lack thereof, uh, on the fight against COVID. And as we all know, uh, that remains still principally unknown. Um, what I want to do in the next slide is very quickly go back to why do we why have we singled out uh, as an inaugural uh, conversation with yourselves uh, the exchange rate as a potential uh, input cost into um, into the manufacturing entities and uh, if you look at what's been shown to you uh, I've basically just um, pointed out uh, what drives exchange rates and in a nutshell. Uh, it's everything under the face of the sun, literally. Uh, as a matter of fact, in open, open economy, macroeconomics, the exchange rate really is uh, crystallized. It's where all economic imbalances resolves itself. So if you're balancing your internal side with the external, uh, the stabilizer really is the exchange rate. And uh, what we've seen, at least with the heightened pace of 
um, economic integration, and as I've said, open market macroeconomy, uh, open market macro macroeconomics. Uh, we've seen an increased interest away from even equities, more into the FX space. Rafael, felt like the felt like the Facebook crash of yesterday. <laughs> yes, I, sorry, Rajan. I think no, we... no. I know. It's. Uh, I'm just saying that yesterday was a very big event in terms yes. of the Facebook. Uh, yeah, what's that? I think, I think despite Fozan claiming I'm an oracle, I didn't see that coming. So much for his uh, <laughs> superlatives. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, no. Right. Did we get for Zon back on at least? <laughs> the Yes, so I believe Fauzan is now back on and there are 83 participants. Uh, Fauzan, you may want to turn your camera on. Yes, Fazan, we can now see you. Hi, apologies, apologies, everybody, for for uh, this inconvenience. Um, it seems the gremlins that uh, brought down uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram yesterday um, also had some kind of uh, touch in what's going on. It seems to be uh, a global issue, but nonetheless, uh, just underpins what we are talking about. We are in uh, an unpredictable and uh, volatile market. Um, our Omaha of NCBA had said that there's a lot of uh, volatility. So he did predict in some form or the other that uh, something might happen whilst we were on the call. But yeah, um, over, over to, to Raphael. Thank you so much for what you've been saying so far. Apologies again that uh, the call uh, dropped, but uh, over to you. Well, thanks for Zan. I, I, I was saying earlier that the uh, clearly the uh, I'm not, I don't have as much oracle skills as, you, as you're suggesting. I would have known that <laughs> I was going to be pushed out of the call. But anyway, welcome back, everybody, uh, our clients. I think I'll try and get everything that I intended to say out very quickly, uh, just in case uh, somebody decides that we, we shouldn't be on the platform any longer. Uh, I was at the point of just going back to the basics of the exchange rate. And the reason I'm doing this is, uh, uh, it's our considered view that uh, of all the cost uh, input challenges that our Kenyan manufacturing um, entities face, 
the one that is often understated, but it's also as critical, is uh, the risk on the exchange rate or and the volatility is there too. The management of the same uh, brings significant complexity to your balance sheets, uh, but also ends up loading onto costs in ways that makes you uncompetitive or uh, less competitive. Uh, and as uh, Rajan pointed out, uh, in terms of uh, improving the policy environment, including uh, manufacturing competitiveness, I think Job, Juan Johi and the policy research team at Kama are doing a good job in terms of just analytical support for that work. And we've seen, for instance, uh, in broader map, government macroeconomic policy making, uh, some of those notable steps, including in the big four agenda, uh, where manufacturing is a key pillar. And if you look at the uh, design of the big four, the manufacturing pillar, it speaks to some of the ways in which you improve that competitiveness. Uh, also notably is uh, lacking, of course, is the question of the exchange rates, and I'm putting it uh, to you that uh, we therefore think that in our partnership um, with, with yourselves, at least this is one uh, ambit for which the bank ourselves as NCBA can be exceedingly helpful uh, insofar as reducing your uh, you are uh, costs of, of doing business uh, by way of the uh, exchange rate channel. Um, the there are different a raft of factors that I said. I say that uh, everything, every macroeconomic imbalance uh, literally resolves itself in the exchange rate. Uh, and what we do have currently, at least uh, the reigning economic regimes, is uh, heightened integration of all economies and. Uh, most people are running op open capital accounts. So it's open, um, open economy, macroeconomics as it were. And that therefore means that literally every handle that you can see there drives or impacts the exchange rate one way or another. Uh, starting with public debt, I guess that's topical in the Kenyan context. Uh, I think depending on how every sovereign entity runs its uh, public finances, that can have uh, significant imports for your exchange, car exchange rate. So for instance, if you're driving wider deficits, that's that implications for your borrowing activity, crowding out effect. I think Rajan did point out that and John as well. Uh, of course, driving the level of interest rate, which really is the price of the currency. And then uh, of course, depending on which direction it goes, it will move the currency uh, one way or the other. Uh, interest rates related to the public debt question, of course, just uh, two days ago, we had a release of inflation data that shot up to 6.9%. Uh, that's a direct, um, has direct implications for how the exchange rate pans out. Uh, lower inflation, of course, is presumed uh, favorable. Keep in mind that uh, the goals of macroeconomic policy really remain three, especially within the open uh, economy context, which is one, you want the fastest growth possible. Uh, with low inflation, of course, with the stablest of the current account that you can't get, whatsoever, which means your export and import competitiveness has to come into the equation. So to that extent, uh, your inflation dynamic uh, is one that you have to pay attention to. Uh, there is one ugly one on the left, uh, ugly for those who are non-market practitioners, but of course, God sent for uh, market practitioners directly, which is a question of sentiment, uh, sometimes referred to as speculation in some areas. So it, it acquires a negative tone uh, when speculation is slapped onto it. But generally what it means is uh, the, this, the sentiment that guides uh, perceptions around uh, relative strength of different economies, including their currencies, uh, can sometimes drive uh, uh, currency uh, behavior or outcomes in ways that uh, one ought to pay attention to. Uh, the crucial one, of course, is the balance of payment side, and that is the two, the rest of the two on the left. So balance of trade or annual current account uh, is of in significant uh, importance to how your currency plays out. Now, that's just basically what it is. The reason I wanted to bring that out is uh, I'm going to very quickly then go into what we have seen happen and how we see this panning out. And it was important that we at least go back to this basic uh, framework for which to discern uh, some of the thoughts that we wanted to share with your members. So if you go to slide 14, um, 14, yes, uh, the, there is no question that going back to, uh, almost back to 2016, uh, all the way into the, uh, I mean, the commencement of the crisis that's COVID, uh, the Kenya shilling has uh, demonstrated very, very remarkable stability. 
Now, this does not mean that it has not a yo yoed one way or the other. I mean, that's as it should be. This is actually liberalized and floating currency. So you would expect that as the imbalances arise, the currency will, uh, will, will pivot one way or the other. But if you look at the long run trend, it has been a very stable currency. Whose stability was, of course, uh, consequentially disrupted uh, around March of last year. Uh, at the onset of the crisis. Uh, at some point, I think you recall that the currency was even voted one of the most perform best performing currencies um, in Africa, uh, given uh, what we had seen. And of course, uh, over the duration, uh, in terms of all the macro objectives that we have, be it inflation, uh, the exchange rate itself, of course, interest rates, there have been notable macroeconomic stability that's been reflected on that. Uh, that, of course, has been disrupted. Uh, I still think that, uh, in fairness, uh, you'd say that given the context of the crisis, the management uh, of the currency, despite that pressure, has still been uh, pretty remarkable. Uh, if you go back then to what we saw in Kenya, and the reason I'm showing that is because uh, that's what I wanted to actually um, close out on. So what's happening in Kenya currently? One is uh, the economy, um, whether you take it from the business side, households, or government, uh, has sort of factored in uh, this new reality of living with COVID, uh, despite its strains. And I think uh, it's an endemic uh, sort of a scenario, uh, pretty much similar to how we have lived through the uh, HIV pandemic, which is still ongoing, and people presume uh, almost uh, forget that it's still with us and, 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 and it's still in still swing. So in some ways, uh, we are seeing very strong adaptability from businesses. We are seeing uh, people finding ways of trying to protect uh, each other and continue going on with their normal economic lives uh, despite this strain. Uh, of course, I don't want to be insensitive to forget that there's been a lot of pain in the process. But what I'm trying to suggest is that the, the equilibrium that we see sort of uh, playing out is an endemic scenario of uh, with COVID rather than uh, waiting for an end date. And then we have a new world, uh, what uh, somebody would refer to as post COVID. As a matter of fact, I think that's uh, further out. We still do not know whether that is actually uh, will be possible, maybe to end 2023, if not beyond. All right, uh, the uh, reason for this sort of uh, improvement in uh, growth prospects in Kenya, of course, is heavily supported by uh, improved vaccination campaigns as well. And then, of course, our, our, our coil, coil back of uh, the stringent, stringent containment measures that we had put in place in order to protect livelihoods. Uh, we have seen across all indices, be it on the stock market side or the purchasing managers uh, index, suggesting that there is some recovery coming through. As a matter of fact, uh, external demand as well is opening up, given the uh, relative success of OECD countries uh, with regard to fighting the pandemic, but also just uh, in terms of their recovery efforts. Uh, because of that, our projections for um, this year uh, is at, the GDP will close out at about 4.8%, um, all right? And uh, that will be a dramatic recovery from the contraction of minus 0 0.3, uh, which is where we close to 2020. Now I'm conscious of time, so you'll excuse me uh, if I'm rushing through, given that we got a disruption there. But the upshot of, of, of this is, uh, if you go to uh, slide 18, um, the volatility is not likely to uh, phase out uh, because we've just gotten in, officially gotten into uh, the slide 18, please. We've just gotten into uh, the political season. And uh, I, I think uh, that the, the headline that we put on the right there is a saying that His Excellency basically said, look, uh, I will not spare you the volatility. I'll also even make the political context, even uh, that's much shocking to you. So that's just going to aggravate uh, the uh, macroeconomic environment. And so in conclusion, I have literally cut off uh, everything that I wanted to say, so we can go to the solution in bit. Uh, but in conclusion, uh, the, the shilling um, has seen sustained uh, but moderate pressure. 
All right. Uh, the all the drivers that I pointed out in that schema uh, have been mixed. The performance there too has been mixed. Uh, but uh, the developments that we are seeing, at least from the latest reports from uh, KNBS, is suggesting that there will be some relative stability on all those fronts. And even though COVID uh, aggravated earlier vulnerabilities, and those that may may persist, uh, especially on the public debt side, we do actually believe that. Uh, uh, some stability will ensue in the currency. So we'll see that move north, which I pointed out in the chart, but with relative stability uh, there too. So uh, uh, the adjustments that we are seeing from the monetary policy side or the fiscal side, I'm sure you've uh, had this ad nauseum. Uh, we've seen a continued support with uh, monetary policy accommodation. We think that will stay to end of year and potentially uh, some uh, uh, early parts of 2021. Uh, but the uh, pressure, given what we've seen, particularly on the uh, reserve situation, uh, is manageable uh, given the context. Now, in terms of solutions, because this is why we are here, forget the macro pitch that I've just done, uh, we have a very strong um, global markets practice. And uh, what we see as a solution for manufacturers is uh, to consider uh, opportunities for managing these risks actively, particularly the risk of the exchange rate. Now, uh, our approach remains that of dynamic heading. So we we'll st we'll start off by first understanding the macro climate, uh, which our teams can take you through. With that understanding, uh, looking at the budgets that your manufacturers run, uh, we can then have uh, more bespoke uh, solutions for managing that currency risk. Because we believe that if you take out that headache, uh, your cost of doing business is that much lower and of course making you much more competitive and the recovery that we foresee for 2021 that will be ideal. So there are raft of products that are global markets team, they are on the call actually. So for the Q&A, uh, we will uh, be able to address some of the specifics. Uh, you'll excuse me, I'm trying to make sure that I leave uh, time for the other presentation from the bank and as much time for the Q&A. So I'll stop there because I'm going to hand over back to you. Yeah, Rafael, uh, you know, thank you so much for that in-depth uh, analysis and uh, presentation. Um, you know, some of the some of the points that you that you covered are quite material and key um, to the way that we see the markets moving forward, to the economy moving forward, um, and definitely, you know, the micro the macro environment does somewhat dictate what happens on a micro level and especially in SMEs. Um, you know, what you've said is 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 very key that um, manufacturing is uh, a big four agenda. Um, it's key to the economy. We've seen um, economies that are that are quite resilient and and bold in the global environment have very strong manufacturing sectors. You know, we only have to look at you know countries like the like like Germany. Um, you know, including the the tiger economies of the Far East uh, that have maintained uh, you know very strong manufacturing um, um, economies. Uh, they've somewhat maintained and stayed uh, very resilient. Um, you know. I, I, I liked the point that you brought up about evolution of business models. Um, I think that's key for any manufacturer who's listening to this. Um, you know, change is constant and we must always look at how we want to evolve and how we are progressing to move forward. Um, and you know, the, the, the Chicago Board Volatility Index um, still captured the fact that volatility is there. Um, you know, there was a big upshot that we had uh, when COVID struck. Um, but we've still not gone back to pre-COVID levels, um, albeit that we've got a, you know, quite a, a significant vaccination drive, but the volatility still continues. Um, you know, after COVID, we had the, um, the, the ship that got stuck in, 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 um, in the Suez Canal, which disrupted uh, global value chains um, and logistics. Um, that had a significant impact on manufacturers locally, we know that. Um, and, you know, like you quite rightly said, is that the pandemic has aggravated uh, earlier frailties, um, you know, which is which is quite critical also to, to any manufacturer who's listening to this. Uh, you know, costs of inputs always will impact uh, bottom line um, and very much where, where a manufacturer or any business person can see that they're going to make money all of a sudden a disruption happens. And if they haven't prepared for it, uh, what would be profits can easily turn into losses. Um, also, the fact that you said, you know, inflation is at 6.5%. Um, generally, economies would prefer lower inflation and more stable FX rates. Uh, this part of the world where we, where we live in, that's not always um, possible. However, we do have 
um, a lot of solutions available in order to identify and mitigate that risk. We are in um, a new normal, and, and as a result, we do need to change um, and adapt. Um, you very quite rightly say, you know, vol volatility is going to go up, um, COVID aside or not, given that we are going into a political season. We know historically, um, you know, markets become, especially in this country, very volatile as you get into the year of um, elections. So it's critical that we, 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 you know, identify those and have the, the relative mitigants. Um, so yeah, now moving, moving on to, to the solutions that we have, um, you know, I'd like to introduce uh, my, my colleague um, who is a, our trade specialist. He goes by the name of uh, George Kiliwa. Um, you know, George has a wealth of experience and knows exactly how to structure trade solutions. Um, coupled with what uh, Raphael had said with respect to volatile markets um, and volatile volatility within the, the FX markets, um, it's critical for manufacturers, I believe, to have trade solutions. We've also seen um, a lot of overseas uh, sort of suppliers moving from open account to more structured uh, solutions or requesting the, the importer rather to either pay cash up front. Um, which again, you know, is a cost. So there, I'll allow George to go into it. I don't want to steal his uh, his thunder, but George is a very respected and very well uh, seasoned uh, trade specialist. Um, and over to you, George. Uh, thank you, thank you, everyone. I hope I'm um, audible. Please, back on me if my um, capacity to communicate goes down. But thank you everyone it's my privilege to speak to you to discuss with you and come up with um, areas of solutioning uh just uh, going by what fozana said i just repeat that in the 90s and 2000 up to 2015 every forum will tell you that the world trade is moving from documentary to open but after covid we've seen that reversal most of trade being getting back to documentary. Um, granted that we have um, manufacturers, we have suppliers outside there, mainly China, who are aggregating jittery and uh, would want to protect their, their positions. And therefore it's well understood why we more than before need to know what to do with the shift from open account now to documentary trade the scenario had gone to almost 60-40, uh, 64 open account, 44 documentary, but we certain that is going to reverse and get back to the original 40 for open and 60 for documentary. So th thanks a lot. Let's go to the next slide, please. I would want us to spend a few minutes on this slide um, to define supply chain. Supply chain, a chain of upstream and downstream businesses engage in arm's length transactions, selfish arm's length transactions, each of them, everyone pulling their, or to their side in an effort to bring a product through the stages of sourcing, manufacturing and delivery to consumer. Consumer is the one who pays all these processes. Money comes from the consumer only to pay even the supplier. Um, the supply chain finance as we define it in the bank, the set of bank solutions are available for financing specific goods, as they move from origin to destination along the supply chain. And we have in the house um, manufacturers and most of what we're going to be discussing is going to center on manufacturers. Um, the manufacturer will get their goods, their raw material, their machinery, their tools and implements from the suppliers who most of them are, we do have local, most of them are foreign. We've seen trade moving close to 40% to China, uh, a source of raw material. China has not embraced open account to a very large extent. So we will ask ourselves then what are our fears from where we sit as manufacturers. We are worried, uh, the manufacturer is worried that uh, if he's asked to pay in advance, the goods may not come, he may not receive anything. Um, is worried that you may receive goods that are not of quality. Again, some you may be worried that you may receive goods uh, 
originating from a country that is in the radar, that is sanctioned. And as we all know that banks will not be able to pay for such goods and uh, supply will be disrupted. Or he may even be worried that uh, the goods will come late and um, when they come late uh, outside the plan, of course they will fail in delivering to consumer and therefore will not be paid. Um, so all these worries as we go to the um, facilities or what we offer to, to manufacturers to, to mitigate that, we will see what the bank places at disposal of customers, of manufacturers to dispel all these worries. Um, again, just go back a bit. Um, when the manufacturer has produced their finished goods and they need to take it to the retailer and to their consumer to be able to pay, as you said, the consumer pays everybody. Again, he's worried that his distributor may not pay if he gives uh, goods in, on credit. Or may also be worried that once he, the distributor sells, he will use the proceeds to buy from competition. Or even the distributor will not give enough shelf space to the, his, his, his goods. Or even uh, when it gets to the retailer, that there may not be enough control, good control of how the, the, the his goods reach to the consumer. The consumer is not in this chain, but is the most important um, because he's, as he paid, he pays everyone. So the set we have for, for, for to manufacturers, the set of solutions uh, goes around first uh, assisting them to get um, money out of the supply chain after they have sold, and also getting to, 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 to be concerned on how they sort out their supply chain, their supplier issues, which we'll see both in terms of financing, financing where the bank literally gives money to our manufacturers and, 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 and helps them unlock value and services, which is how the, our manufacturers will be able to, to get to protect as themselves as they do the imports. So let's move to the next. From these, one of the key, um, the, the, the key problems, the key worries of the manufacturer is after they have sold or after they, when they are required to pay. And look at this, look at this CISO. This is a selfish CISO. You have the, a supplier, um, a supplier or a manufacturer at some point and a buyer. The buyer wants to pay later, much later, as late as possible. The supplier wants to be paid now as soon as possible. And therefore the bank needs to bridge that gap. So we offer and industry offers factoring, factoring which is payment of early payment of supplier invoices by the buyer. And this product that you will find in the market and with ourselves focuses on the buyer. It is a financing solution where supplier finances the receivables were process initiated by the buyer, the ordering party. Every conversation therefore is done with the buyer. The buyer is the one who holds payables. He is the one supposed to pay the supplier on a certain future date. And so for a manufacturer, I would want us to focus on, uh, on, on just this, this product first, then we'll go back to, this, to the supply chain and see how the manufacturer fits in. So again, conflicting interest, pay late as late as possible and pay and be paid as early as possible. So for this solution, we focus on the buyer and assess the buyer and take a risk in buying the, uh, the payables of the buyer. Next slide, please. So um, the, the call we pick, the call we take, I hope you can be able to see the slide. It's not visible to me. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we can see. Yeah. Thanks, thank you. The, the, the call we take, as I said, is on the buyer and the intention is to buy receivables from the supplier. So the supplier will uh, supply as usual. There will be a commercial agreement reached with the supplier. 
uh, to sell on an invoice of a thousand. And the supplier will log in into a system that we've provided, which has been accepted by the buyer. The buyer will first accept that and confirm through a system that we do provide that uh, the invoice is good to be bought if offered. And then the supplier will log in and sell the invoice to the bank and the bank will pay less some discount interest the next day. The turnaround time for purchasing invoices is um, one day. The general uh, guiding factor in this process is that the bank wears the shoes that were worn by the supplier immediately before the sale. So the bank assumes the risks responsibilities, rights, and obligations that were assumed by the supplier before the sale. Let's go back to place the manufacturer on the chain, on the supply chain, in as far as reverse factoring is concerned. Uh, just a step, uh, two steps back. So as I said, the bank looks at the buyer. The manufacturer may be a buyer, a buyer from a buyer of uh, goods from the supplier. So if the manufacturer is the buyer, we will focus on the payment ability and therefore the worth of the receivable from that buyer. So if the manufacturer is a buyer, then the manufacturer will fit in as an anchor because the manufacturer is the one who determines whether the invoice is sellable and, and, and can be bought because he has to confirm before we get to buy. If the manufacturer is a seller, as in if we put, if we pick a distributor as a supermarket chain, if the manufacturer is a seller, then the bank will place the program on the distributor, the supply, uh, the supermarket chain, and allow purchasing of receivables from the supermarket chain to the manufacturer. So the owner of the program is the buyer, is the one who determines whether the invoices are sellable, can be bought, and the supplier in whichever stage of the supply chain offers to sell those receivables to the bank. It is a true sale without recourse to the supplier. If the debt is not payable, the bank goes after the buyer. And, 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 and does not get back to the supplier for, 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 uh, for recourse. That is, uh, this, that is um, reverse factoring, which we offer and endeavor to buy and therefore shorten the life cycle of the conversion cycle of suppliers, uh, because then they can rotate and get to, 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 to go to the next cycle of production and to the next cycle of sell, uh, without worrying about whether they will be paid at the end because the bank takes the payment risk of the buyer. We'll get tech questions at the end, I presume. We will look at uh, another, just go to slide, slide three. Thank you. Um, this is another financing product that will give another financing solution uh, to finance the downstream, the downstream from the manufacturer, the distributors of the consumable goods that the manufacturer produces. And here the bank will focus on the distributor. The bank will take risk on the distributor. Again, going back to what are the worries of the manufacturer that they will release goods to the distributor and the distributor will not give them attention or will not display them properly or will sell and use the money to buy goods from another distributor, from another manufacturer, or just not pay. And therefore, to resolve the credit issue, the bank comes in to engage with the distributor on introduction by the uh, manufacturer and write a facility that enables the, the buyer to release goods on the strength, on the payment strength and promise of the bank that if goods are released to the distributor, the bank undertakes to pay. 
So the bank takes risk on distributors and 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 and, and assessing their 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 um, credibility, follows up on stock uh, movements, um, um, and, and gives the desired undertaking to the to the to the buyer that to the to the manufacturer that uh, once they release goods, then the bank goes on to pay. The program we offer at the moment has a 50% collateral uh, cover and a 50% 50 we offer in conjunction with, with um, the Africa Guarantee Fund. And this applies to each and every, um, mainly for consumable, for fast moving consumer goods, but, but, but mainly for uh, distributors who do, and we will find it as a market practice that distributors will uh, will not be exclusive. So you will find um, the bank giving a program for one distributor and a competing product doesn't have the same program. And therefore it is the responsibility of the bank to get to know where its payment source is going to be. What is it in, is it in for the manufacturer? Faster movement of goods through the chain uh, because the, the distributor is assured of full stock levels and, 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 and the fact that the bank has come in also um, gets displayed into the distribution network and, and the distributor pays um, more often than not. And therefore, um, it, it, it's a product that has had low uptake in the market. We do appreciate, but with the help of the Africa Guarantee Fund, it's one that NCBA is very eager to roll out to the, to the manufacturing sector. Next slide, please. Collateral management is old in the market. I'm sure the Nilas in the house know about collateral management. It's a tripartite agreement between the bank and the borrower and the collateral manager focused on manufacturers who import in bulk and want to take the cost of importation at once, save on shipping cost, and, 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 and be able to, uh, so the bank takes the responsibility to finance the stocks as they are kept in some place and releases to the manufacturer uh, real time as they require to pass through the production process. Whatever is not ripe for to be passed through the production process remains in a secure warehouse controlled by a collateral manager and the bank takes um, security of it. Warehouse receipting, the reason why it is uh, very key now, we all appreciate and remember the, 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 the long time initiative by the government, the Ministry of Agriculture, to bring to fruition warehouse financing, warehouse receipt financing. It's an initiative that has taken close to eight years uh, to be developed, but it, we're almost there. It's almost getting to, to, uh, to production. It's an initiative again run by the Ministry of Agriculture through the Warehouse Receiving Council. NCBA is in the pilot banks among other four. Um, the act has been passed. The guidelines have been gazetted. The Warehouse Receiving Council is in the process of certifying warehouses. They indicate to us that they have satisfied more than 22 warehouses in the Rift Valley, mainly NCPB warehouses. And what will come out of this is as, um, a system in the lines of the Nairobi Securities Exchange where banks will be able to buy and mainly help producers and also manufacturers, millers to be specific, a system in the lines of the Nairobi Securities Exchange, which will be traded and the market will be able to trade, um, will be able to trade um, stocks of commodities produced in the country, but which are, um, are warehoused in some place um, run by the ministry. So once this comes up and it's an indication, it's um, something that we've been discussing with the millers that we do bank. Once this comes up, then we will be rolling it out and the benefits that have been waited for more than eight years will be visible. So warehouse receipting, receipt financing is not live in the market, but it is going to be done once the act is, is perfected through the ministry. Thank you. Let's go ahead. 
So uh, the next, those are the, the financing product we give as we, um, where we help customers, um, manufacturers, unlock value from their sales as their goods and services move through the supply chain. So the bank gives loans, trade loans, from what you've discussed to be able to, un to unlock, say to the manufacturers to unlock the value as their products move through the supply chain. Over the next few minutes, we are going to look at the concerns that we raised at the start of the talk. What, what is the concern? What are the worries of manufacturers as they import, as they get to, as they get um, goods from, from abroad, from China specific, where, which has been driving the, the, the movement from open account back to documentary trade. Letters of credit are held in the market. They had declined when the trend was moving towards open account, but at least from what we've seen this year, it's getting back to, 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 to documentary trade, as we said. And with letters of credit, the manufacturer will approach the bank and display their fears. We are, the manufacturer, as we said, is concerned that goods will arrive late after he's asked to pay. And the LC will ask, will, 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 will protect that because we'll put a latest date of shipment. The manufacturer is concerned the poor quality of goods is going to come. We will have a quality certificate put there that will confirm what good, what quality has come. The manufacturer again is concerned that um, uh, the goods may pass through sanctioned countries and when the goods come, they will not be able to pay for it and they'll be stuck at the port. Again, they will designate a port of loading. Where do you want your goods to come from? Manufacturer, again, will be concerned that they may pay and they do not get goods. Again, documents in there, the bill of lading will ensure that the goods are in Mombasa before you are asked to pay. And they will also define what kind of goods are in Mombasa. And therefore, the manufacturer defines their, view, their, their fears and allays them to the bank through an application form and tells the bank, these are my fears. You have the money to pay so long as this is what comes up. So please, if we are supposed to pay, uh, if, we, if you pay and these documents have not been presented, then you have no authority to debit my account. And that is what we do by giving letters of credit. We allay the fears of the manufacturers in doing international trade especially that now it is getting to, to, to uh, documentary trade and, 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 and protect, take away the risks that will be uh, uh, subjected to, this, um, to the international trade. Again, goods have arrived and there are no documents. We will allay fears through the letters of credit. Next, please. We give guarantees, um, the array of guarantees that you will see here to protect, again, um, to, to, to facilitate, it's a service that we give to, to, to facilitate um, trade, to facilitate import and export. A recipient of a guarantee is a giver of a guarantee with custom bonds here and shipping guarantees. If you are to receive, you will also be able to give. So in the position of the manufacturer then, if they will be supposed to give a guarantee if they are doing a job somewhere or supplying a school or an institution and had need to give a bid bond or, a, or a, a performance guarantee, then we do give. If they are to receive uh, from a distributor a guarantee to guarantee payments, a payment guarantee, then we will facilitate the receipt. If they are supposed to, in, to give to KRF or import custom duties, then the bank facilitates um, uh, the service. It is a service for which we charge a commission, not uh, a financing. Thank you. Um, as we move again to documentary trade, um, shippers or suppliers in, in China and elsewhere will send documents to the bank and instruct the bank to release documents to importers, manufacturers of raw material against payment or against an undertaking to pay in future. 
And this is what we do with documentary collections. It is rare, uh, it's getting rare because suppliers are getting jittery again of the, the, the payment ability or the payment capacity of um, um, this part of the world, because we do appreciate, we may be willing to pay, but we may not be able to pay. And we know the situation in Ethiopia. Um, customer may want to pay, manufacturer may want to pay out, but they do not have the FX allocation to pay. Thank God we don't have a situation like that. But um, again, they are worried that um, the, our, um, the manufacturers may be, may be able to pay, but they are not um, enabled to pay. So documentary collections, we see them going down and we see uptake of letters of credit because then that is the commitment of the bank that they'll take care of the FX uh, risks. So this is something else that we give and um, goes on to, to augment or to help or to do what letters of credit are not able to do. Uh, thank you. I chose to rush the presentation because I know it is not new. Um, what we've mentioned is not, is not uh, new to the, um, the, the uh, participants, the team in the house. So, and, and, and we'll be very happy to take questions so that we identify where the focus is and get to address to address uh, those issues in a specific manner. Back to you, Fozan. Okay. Um, yeah, George. Thanks. Thanks very much for that uh, elaborate presentation. Um, you know, I'm conscious that uh, there's a lot of information that you've given out, um, and it can be in in some respects quite uh, in depth and quite daunting for someone who's new to some of those things. Um, but um, the, the, the financial instruments that we have, but you know, what I want to just give everybody a sense of um, uh, sort of clarity is that all the solutions that George has mentioned, they unlock value um, across the value chain. They provide um, sort of more peace of mind and they provide a structure to your trading environment. Now, what do I mean by that? Very much um, what, what George has brought out is that if you look at any manufacturer, they've got a value chain. On one side, they'll have a distributor, and on the other side, they'll have a supplier. And in the middle, um, where the manufacturer is, either they'll be manufacturing something from scratch, or they'll be value adding to, to sell. Where George comes into the whole um, sort of value chain is that he provides solutions um, in order to ensure that the raw material that's coming in is of, of, of good quality, um, it ensures that, um, you know, um, it reduces your upfront finance costs. Um, and with having the bank in the middle, um, in many respects, it moves um, a manufacturer or a supplier taking di direct risk on a manufacturer to taking bank risk, um, which any supplier would, would, would prefer to take bank risk um, compared to direct um, buyer risk unless the buyer is of a significant corporate. So I think um, for all of you manufacturers listening out here, uh, the solutions that, that our trade finance desks provide are very critical to, to helping you grow. Um, and I think as Rajan had originally stated, um, is very much in line with capacity building which is one of the agendas of, um, um, of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Now, you know, there's a lot of words that, uh, that, that George used, but you know, reverse factoring uh, is, is basically just creating liquidity in order to ensure that your suppliers are, are paid um, upfront because you'll already have receivables on the other side or cash coming in um, from, your, from your purchases. Um, and it's just getting that liquidity moving. Um, he mentioned distributor financing, which is which is quite critical because you might be an anchor or you might be a distributor to an anchor. Um, with what does the bank look to do there? Um, if you're an anchor, you want to make sure that your product is getting out to market um, as quickly as possible, um, and you have the most amount of reach as possible. Uh, the bank comes in to provide so, um, financing solution to that distributor so that they are in a position to buy um, from the anchor. Um, in some respects, we'll go directly to the distributor and we'll provide the distributor with financing to ensure that they can have uh, direct uh, sort of 
distribution um, structures or you know even as something as simple as vehicles to make sure that they they can they can uh, distribute out um, the other thing what he mentioned was warehouse receiving um, you know we are one of the four banks that that have been selected to with with, uh, with this initiative I mean um, collateral managed solutions um, are quite critical within this market because what we find is some manufacturers and up and coming businesses might not have security up front. Um, and in this market, you know, security tends to become a key uh, sort of condition of lending. Um, but then again, that said, we lend to cash flows, not to security. Um, but the collateral managed uh, solutions are quite effective uh, in, in managing some of the risks and also providing liquidity to um, manufacturers and suppliers. So I am conscious that, that you know, some of the term, termino terminology might be, sound quite complex, uh, but when you debunk it, it, it does become relatively and comparatively easier to understand. And it's uh, one of those things that as you trade more and you, and you grow as an institution, um, it becomes, uh, you know, a lot, a lot easier to, to understand. But the only image that I want to leave you with is um, any institution will have themselves in the middle. And then on, let's say on the left side, they'll have the supplier, uh, the supply chain, and on the right, there'll be the distributor chain. What we know within these markets is that a lot of liquidity gets stuck uh, within that value chain. Uh, where the bank comes in is to unlock that liquidity to make sure that there's velocity of cash that's moving across. Um, and our aim is always to build capacity and also reduce your costs so that your margins are there. Um, at the same time, what I wanted to bring out is because of the volatility in the markets, a manufacturer might place an order today. Uh, they might be required to pay within six months or something um, at a future date. There's a risk there. Because of, the, because of the period of um, uh, time. And then because of the time value of money and what George very correctly said was that there's a conflict between buyers and suppliers. The buyer wants to be uh, uh, pay as late as possible. The supplier wants to collect as quickly as possible. The bank comes in to bridge that funding gap that's created and also provide a harmonious uh, relationship. So thank you very much, George. For, for those uh, very deep and meaningful insights um, and also all the solutions that you, that you gave us. Now, um, there are some questions that have come up um, and what I wanted to do was I want to um, ask someone, someone has asked, um, and this I think would be quite relevant to you, Raphael, is that the um, Kenya's shilling seems to not be correctly valued. Um, what's your opinion on the on the value of the Kenya shilling? Uh, thanks, Fozlan. I think they are they are, and thanks for that question. Uh, I'll take it together with uh, Sachin. Sachin, as you look in the chat, Sachin has typed out a very comprehensive, um, I think, analysis on the exchange rate and uh, prospects there too. So I'll take both. Uh, is the Kenya shilling overvalued? Uh, I, I think, first of all, the, the vernacular is important to distinguish because overvaluation or undervaluation, uh, depending on uh, one's interest, whether on the import side or the export side, uh, is sometimes contentious. What I'd like to encourage uh, us to think of is misalignment. And why do I say misalignment? Because the exchange rate uh, as I'd said in uh, open economy, macroeconomics is really a stabilizer. And when you liberalize your capital account, uh, the reason you are doing that is you're uh, allowing for a mechanism uh, to balance out your internal uh, economic priorities with the external, especially when uh, there, we talk about uh, economic integration, which is really uh, the pervasive uh, norm that we see right now. So, so much so that uh, in actual fact, and I think the governor uh, innumerously has uh, uh, demonstrated this, uh, you shouldn't really be worried about uh, the nominal value of the exchange rate. Uh, what uh, should be of concern to any 
person uh, is of course the uh, stability there too. So whichever direction it moves to balance, uh, your internal and the external, uh, that movement ought to be stable. And that really is the primary concern. Now, uh, just a bit of history very quickly. So Kenya liberalized its capital account in October of uh, 1993, okay? And uh, if you are going to assess uh, the movement of the currency from then to date in order to see whether uh, it's been misaligned, in other words, moving away or out of skilter from the uh, economic fundamentals of the day. That's the analysis that you do. And what we do in uh, foreign exchange uh, microeconomics is the different frameworks. And uh, the most notable one at least that's uh, been used widely is uh, using the behavioral equilibrium exchange rate approach, uh, which basically means uh, that you look at a raft of factors, you are uh, net foreign assets, uh, you are uh, forbearing economic uh, situation, all manner of macro variables that you look at in balance to your, uh, on a trade weighted basis, your principal trade person, and then see whether the currency uh, at the current nominal level or in a real sense, uh, is actually anchored on the economic fundamentals of the day. Now, to answer you directly, uh, Kenya did, uh, in 2019, uh, the IMF, uh, using a different approach, the external balance assessment approach, uh, did uh, point out that in their judgment, the currency was um, overvalued, all right? As a matter of fact, uh, they were suggesting at the time it was staying at 100, that it ought to have been at 117. Uh, in their assessment and what the external balance assessment, which is different from the behavioral ex uh, equilibrium exchange rate framework, uh, it looks basically at uh, your structural policy question. So they looked at Kenya's current account dynamics, the uh, supporting uh, fiscal policy and related uh, policies and, this, and concluded based on empirical assessment of the exchange rate going back 15, 17 years that there was uh, they, they, they could note some sort of um, uh, overvaluation at the time. Of course, you remember that the central bank correctly using the BER approach, which I pointed out to, did their own empirical assessment, conducted robustness checks using other numerous frameworks, and uh, the paper is available. They concluded that the currency was actually well anchored on economic fundamentals. So to that extent, uh, it was a complete rebuttal of the IMA position. Of course, uh, they'd come at that conclusion using different methodologies, but there's credit to the central bank assessment uh, because they did actually conduct robustness checks using other uh, frameworks, which validated their, their assessment. In their case, actually, the, of the, the slides differential was only 4% away from economic uh, fundamental. I'm going back 15, 17 years. So uh, I was looking at this as well. And I think there is, uh, you can tell already from my misgivings, I think there is merit in uh, the central bank reversal. I do not think uh, the currency is uh, in, to use that word, overvalued. And I've said, uh, reality is, we, let's move away from, it would be helpful to move away from the overvaluation connotation to more of alignment to economic fundamentals. And the reason I'm leading to that is uh, you have to bear in mind that the economy has grown. We just rebased our national income accounts. So running to north almost 11 trillion right now. In that process, of course, the re requisite real exchange rate has to move in tandem with that. Uh, we've had that sort of uh, growth uh, in the market, including the diversification there too, within the context of very stable and, uh, uh, and well anchored inflation number. So we are 6.9 right now, of course, there's uh, a threat of that moving higher. But reality is, if we look at the inflation charts, uh, it's been very, very, as a matter of fact, Kenya's economic success to the extent that you can think there is any, has been heavily predicated on very stable uh, macroeconomic environment. And uh, indeed, even in the post-COVID recovery strategy, uh, one of the key limbs remains maintaining that uh, stability as an input into uh, the recovery efforts into 2021. So that's what I'd say about the currency. But Sachin brings a very interesting uh, angle. So here he says, if I was to summarize for those who haven't read it, uh, Sachin uh, is saying, if you look at the energy crisis in China, you look at the energy markets development, broadly, uh, especially uh, Brent prices and its input in the Kenyan cost side, there is a threat, notable threat, and I agree, of a cost push inflation getting into the play. 
So our 6.9%, although well anchored and still within the 7.5% upper target, there is a threat of cost put inflation, of course, input of manufacturing products coming of China being costlier, and then of course, our own energy prices, which of course has reached all furore uh, in the last couple of days, uh, driving that cost push. I agree, that's a risk that we have to watch out for. He then brings out a second component, which is also true that yes, uh, servicing our foreign debt with China uh, will raise pressure on our reserves, all right? So in, in the, to the extent that we're servicing those reserves, from a reserve position adequacy point of view, you will have uh, that pressure. So both to, of course, escalate the pressure on the currency. And so to his question, yeah, if you agree and I agree, uh, what then is outlook for Kenya shilling? And I think I pointed out in my rush comments in the intro that that indeed is the underpinning analytical mindset with which we are seeing the currency. We are convinced, however, that at 9.5 billion worth of reserves, even if you are to factor in those uh, foreign for, uh, commitment repayments back, uh, there is still significant watches. That's about 5.8 months of import cover. So there's still significant watches within the central bank to manage the stability there too. Directionally, of course, uh, and that pressure noted, especially if the uh, forbearing inflation outlook uh, based on this cost factor that is raising uh, tarry out, and the likelihood of that is, of course, as high as I've already intoned. Reality is then one has to bear in mind that we'll have that sort of uh, uh, negative push to on the currency, but within manageable stores. As a matter of fact, uh, in every conversation uh, you have from the MPC debates or, or rather from the central bank, uh, there is acknowledgement of, look, uh, we, can, we, we can bear that sort of move whichever direction. Uh, what we are interested in is price stability and money, which then brings me to why this is important for our fora. Uh, our global markets practice can help manufacturers on the call be able to uh, manage that risk. From a budgeting point of view, we can sit down with you, uh, look at your budgets, look at your currency commitments, whichever side, whether left-hand side or right-hand side, import or export, and then look at mechan the different instruments in the market that we can use to make sure that we take away the headache of these vagaries in the market. Because in our considered view, if you take out that headache of these vagaries of the market noise, including the seasonality there too, uh, you'll be able to then manage what's more important to you uh, to be able to stay competitive. And of course, all of us benefit collaboratively. So, uh, I mean, uh, we are very glad to make these contacts. And I think this really is the idea uh, behind uh, this commit. So there are forwards, we can do options, we can do uh, structured solutions, depending on the nature of your balance sheet. We can basically manage uh, your risk management on the financial market side in ways that gives you uh, freedom and room to be able to do what's, I think, more consequential, whether you are uh, manufacturing plastics or, or sugar, whatever it is, you can be able to uh, then concentrate on what's more important. But Sachin, I, I think the framing of your question was excellent. Uh, that indeed, it, uh, those are the levers that one has to pay attention to. Uh, but I think uh, with the experience, both within the pandemic and even in the GFC before, global financial crisis before. I think uh, we can only add that, look, this is why banks exist. This is why there is a technical capacity to manage uh, those sort of, I mean, we had Evergrande. So, you know, volatility is not only pandemic, right? even within the pandemic, we just had Evergrande and we'll have many more. As a matter of fact, the nature of financial markets is those ebbs and flows. And indeed it's my submission that I think uh, if we collaborate uh, more closely with yourselves, uh, we should be able to help each other manage this uh, this context a lot better. Thanks. Yeah, um, Rafael, you know, thank you, thank you so much um, for that uh, very elaborate uh, response to Sachin's question. Sachin, thank you so much um, for an absolutely excellent uh, question that you you brought out. Um, I think um, very much. Um, what, what uh, Rafael is saying is that, you know, our view is that uh, the Kenya shilling is not necessarily overvalued. It's just aligned uh, more so to the economy, the way the economy is diversifying and growing. I think that's, uh, uh, that's fair to, to, to have that, uh, that view. Um, I think also what, what, what Rafael brought out in his, uh, in his responses is very critical for a manufacturer or any business in itself to have a budget or a strike price. Um, you know, what, what he's alluding to is 
when you have a strike price, you will have budgeted in, let's say, the Kenya shilling being at 101 when you're importing, and then over six months, th there'll be a risk that you're, you're hoping to take. You know, if it was to hit 110, you still want to make sure that you're, you're within uh, your margin rates. Um, and that's what he was saying is that where the bank can come in and look at your, your, your budgets, um, look at your strategy and what it is, uh, and come in with the effective uh, solution. So, so thanks for bringing that out. Um, one of the other questions, and I think it's quite critical um, at the moment and underpinning volatility was, um, you know, we know that uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, Instagram went down yesterday. I believe, uh, you know, it wiped off uh, $6 billion. I saw in one report of uh, uh, Facebook's uh, stock uh, overnight. Um, you know, we went down uh, today and what he mentioned, um, which is coming out is the, the Evergrande uh, fiasco that's coming out of China, which might be the largest uh, possible default uh, that, that we have seen. Uh, that also is, is sure to have a shockwaves or a ripple, ripple effect to international markets, specifically because of the integration and aggregation and segregation of uh, various financial instruments that go into providing liquidity to such institutions. Um, but yeah, you know, I don't want to bore you with, with, with all of that, but uh, moving on to something that's a bit more uh, relevant. Um, someone has asked, and this is uh, to you, George, um, in general trade, especially amongst distributors and wholesalers, um, the uptake of supply chain finance is low because it is perceived to be expensive. Um, you know, what can we do to change this perception? Uh, th thanks, Rajan. And the, the obvious um, development in the industry that gives all sellers and distributors much or much cheaper uh, financing to do with supply chain is reverse factoring. Because as we said, a bank that puts up a program for reverse factoring looks at the buyer. And to be able to take that risk on that buyer, that buyer must be strong must have undoubted payment ability. And therefore, banks that have developed uh, um, reverse factoring programs, it's, it, 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 it's an obvious indication that the buyer is strong and will be enjoying cheaper pricing from banks. The programs that we've developed ourselves are for top notch corporates and public sector. And the price that the wholesaler or the distributor or the supplier in general will enjoy when they take that supply chain program will be their price risk of the buyer, which will be much cheaper than their own price uh, risk, uh, 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 their own price. And, and therefore to dispel, to dispel uh, and to grow this is to continuously ask buyers of goods that we sell, whether they have developed uh, reverse factoring programs with the banks and with us in specific, then you will be able to take advantage of the price that we have given to them. And, and I believe it's a journey. Um, banks will want to give these programs to their own uh, strong corporates and public sector because remember that the bank is taking um, risk without recourse both operationally and even the payment risk so that they don't go back to the wholesaler or the distributor who has sold and you'll find the price much cheaper than what the uh, specific suppliers can get. Great, great, George. Thanks, thanks so much. I'm conscious that we are running out of time. Um, I just very quickly just wanted to, uh, Githinji Muteru has asked a question to Cam. Um, you know, what, what is, what is Cam, uh, doing on finished products being imported at zero duty while raw materials to manufacture the same locally attracts 25% import duty? Um, and, and what's being done to grow the local manufacturing uh, under this environment? Um, I also noted that CAM came out with a, a study or a response on, on foreign clinker compared to local clinker production and the tariffs with that. Um, I think that question ties in uh, with with what's going on. What what? How can CAM assist in in moving or influencing some of that uh, mindset? 
Okay, thanks, Fazan. Let me answer that. Uh, it's a very relevant question. Thanks, Gidenji, for for your con uh, your concerns and very valid concerns. So let me just put it into context so that we all understand uh, what CAM has been doing and what this all relates to. Uh, pretty much, there's a whole advocacy right now which is going towards creating a four-band structure of tariffs where uh, a raw material, a primary raw material would be at 0%, an intermediate would be at 10%, a finished good at 25%, and if there's anything where there's an additional protection required by a, a local manufacturer uh, because of uh, various other uh, vagaries of, of, of uh, the trade agreements that we might have, which is giving undue competitive advantage to other uh, countries in a trading block, then we, we have also proposed a 35%. And this is a uh, work in progress and it's, it's under finalization. So just if to put into that value stream context, uh, if, 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 if you, you, one needs to understand as a manufacturer where they sit in that value chain. My, whilst one may think that a raw material, it's a, a raw material to, to them, in the whole value stream, it could be an intermediate product. But either way, what we are trying to encourage us can, uh, can is to ensure that more value addition is done within our country, uh, more manufacturing is done that. The only thing that we need to kind of ensure is that uh, the value addition that we are doing is of a nature enough to be able to give us those levels of protection. So without knowing the details, Vana uh, Gidinji, uh, I would encourage that you actually reach out to our uh, team at CAMP and uh, we'll be more than happy to guide you. And even if you have, if, 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 if we, we, we have been actually with many industries kind of fighting uh, and, and, and helping uh, industries to ensure that some of those anomalies uh, in the tariffs can be actually removed so that manufacturers can, uh, but our goal is that people should be manufacturing here and value it. I hope that helps. Uh, yeah, Rajan, thanks, thanks very much uh, for for that response. I think, um, yeah, what you brought out is 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 what we've been discussing as well across, you know, the value chain. Um, you know, it depends what side you what side you sit on, but within that value chain, you have other micro value chains, uh, which, when consolidated, when you look at it aggregate, it, it does have a significant impact. Um, I think what what you're doing uh, quite rightly, as you said about. Uh, influencing policy, it, it's quite important. So thanks very much for that response. Um, you know, ladies and gents, I'm conscious that, uh, you know, we're running out of time and uh, everyone has uh, other things that they want to get up to. Um, and therefore, at this point, you know, I want to thank everybody for their contribution so far. Um, please allow me to bring on uh, Joyce Jogu, um, who's from CAM, to give her closing um, remarks um, and then you know I'll just end it with with a thank you note once she's uh, once she's done um, over to you uh, Joyce thank you thank you Fauzan um, well for this morning we are very glad to have had very good uh, conversations and quite expert knowledge from the team I wish to acknowledge um, the knowledge that we've uh, received from CAM Vice Chair Rajan Shah, where we've, uh, he's shared the vision of the manufacturing sector, our growth trajectory, as well as uh, our advocacy and capacity building programs that are there to help SMEs grow and uh, grow sustainably. And also our SME manufacturing SME hub, where we have consolidated all our activities uh, to be able, just a minute, Uh, sorry for that, uh, just a small interlude. Then um, also I would like to thank the NCBA team uh, with the, you know, sharing a lot of expert knowledge and support from everyone from, uh, of course, Thousand, uh, also your chief economist, Raphael, your head of trade, George. Thank you so much for all the insights you've given us and just uh, for the manufacturers today and also the network of NCBA. We are looking at building competitiveness and resilience um, in, in order to support the growth of manufacturing sector in this uh, webinar. Uh, for those who may have joined late, I noticed quite a number joined late. This is about trade finance and forex solutions in volatile markets. 
And uh, the, a bigger perspective has been in the context of the pandemic and also reviewing the pre-pandemic, during pandemic and also post pandemic. So a lot of uh, strategies have been shared here on how to navigate uh, the challenges, the opportunities, as well as uh, what came out strongly on how to sharpen our risk management acumen, uh, which was a big takeaway from John Okulo, uh, since uh, there'll be a lot of uh, risks that may arise, not just from pandemic, but other emerging uh, risks that uh, come because of uh, a lot of volatilities in the market. Uh, of course, a big area has been on the Forex, so we appreciate that kind of knowledge and also a call for manufacturers uh, to increase their efficiency, whether operational or along the supply chain. And we are quite grateful for that. Also to our members, I know manufacturers are quite engaged, quite busy trying to balance work um, and the business strategies and all the challenges that come with it. We appreciate our members uh, joining this forum. And it is a testament to us that uh, these uh, engagements are relevant to our members. We've had at some point over 125 people joining meaning that discussions are important from our manufacturing priority agenda. Part of access to finance is very critical to our members, uh, whether short term or long term, so that we can increase the investments in this country. And uh, we are glad that our members have been quite engaged, also sharing a lot of um, questions, insights, and also offering to get further support beyond this forum. And uh, we will work jointly with NCBA through the partnership that we have formed and uh, we are promising to move beyond traditional products, solutions, even what has been shared around the trade finance solutions. We're also moving towards deeper engagement, building stronger relationships with manufacturers so that we can meet them at their point of need uh, and also in a timely manner, because part of the financing challenges is timeliness. Sometimes money comes when you really have already gone through a lot of trouble. So how do we meet people in a timely, you know, support them in a timely manner? And we are quite glad to have enjoyed also a lot of insights from the economic aspects, from global perspectives, regional, and uh, also uh, local challenges. So we are looking at the future. How do we navigate uh, the elections that are coming in, the political uncertainty and market speculations, uh, and also safeguard ourselves from sentiments and perceptions that may mislead the market. And we focus on fundamentals as we move forward. So I wish to thank everybody and the team for the opportunity and uh, we are available to pick more suggestions on how we can continue these engagements. We have our own structured engagements, but we welcome new ideas on how we can improve how we engage the industrialists. And eventually uh, the objective really is to promote uh, competitiveness, resilience and the growth of the sector. Thank you very much. Over to you, Paul. Joyce, um, yeah, thanks, thanks very much for, for that, for those um, closing remarks. Um, really appreciated what you said. Uh, critically, you know, um, the MOU that that NCBA signed with uh, with CAM uh, moving forward is going to address a lot of the issues that you brought up. Um, I think what Rajan said um, initially was that we are looking at uh, capacity building, um, and I think also what. Uh, John also said was quite relevant about uh, risk identification, risk mitigation. Um, I really appreciate uh, Rafael's in-depth uh, view on the economy, what's going on and how that uh, gives us the tools um, in order to, to identify uh, the headwinds that might be coming and how we can protect against it. And also um, George was, was very um, uh, descriptive in his uh, uh, recommendations for solutions where the bank can come in and help. Um, where we fit in as, as a bank is, is very much at the center of a lot of these value chains and to bridge the funding gaps that originate um, given the mismatch of, of the cash cycles and working capital cycles. Um, sometimes a lot of this can become very uh, sort of technical and sometimes it can appear difficult. Uh, that's why my urge to anyone listening to this is, is you know, um, find the right bank, find the right advisors around you, find the, the right solution providers um, who can help you navigate, who can help you understand, um, who can help you debunk um, some of the technical uh, aspects of, of what, we, what we hear. Um, we had over 130 participants. People have started dropping off. I appreciate that I've given the time. 
apologies once again for the disruption that we had um, earlier on. Um, what I wanted to just say also, a very special thank you to all the, the panelists, um, you know, uh, George, Raphael, Rajan, George Okulo, who very kindly is in Jinja and um, um, agreed to come on board. Um, I also wanted to say a special thank you to my colleague, uh, uh, colleagues from the NCBA side who made this happen, you know, especially people like Sam Obago, um, you know, Joy Mulay, uh, Kwanzaa, um, colleagues from, from the CAM side, Duata, who, who, who made this happen. So yeah, to the whole team, you know, we, we couldn't have done it without everybody coming together and making it happen. Uh, you know, we are here. Our objective is to inspire greatness. You know, God bless you all. Have a great week ahead um, and keep going for it. Thank you very much. And uh, hope to engage with all of you soon. Thank Good you, Fazan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And you have your, you have your WhatsApp and uh, whatever back, Facebook. <laughs> Absolutely. Your utility. <laughs> I'm back, back connected to the, to the globe. Thanks. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, and it was a great uh, interaction. Thank you, thank you, Rajan. Thank you very much, everybody. Right. Have a good one. All right.